This video is supported by CuriosityStream. We've heard a lot over the years about Moore's Law. Moore's Law being the idea that the number of transistors in a chip doubles every 18 months. Actually, it was originally every year, and then it became every 18 months. Now it's more like every two years. It's almost like it's slowing down. This is partially because we've pretty much reached the limit of how small transistors can get. Transistors are basically little gates that open and close to allow electrons to flow or not flow through them. The open state and the closed state, they translate to ones and zeros, which the computer then uses to perform calculations. The problem is these gates have gotten so small that the gates don't always work perfectly. To continue the whole gate metaphor, you could say it has a busted latch. Right now the gate size has gotten down to 7 nanometers, and can we just stop for a second and appreciate how amazing it is that we can actually make things, manufacture things at only 7 nanometers across? Alright, start appreciating. Okay, that's been a few seconds, thank you. What's even more amazing is that we could physically actually go smaller, but quantum physics has other ideas. The problem is when you go down below 7 nanometers, quantum tunneling starts to happen. This is basically the electron saying, ain't no gate can hold me, and they just kind of jump right across. Electrons have bad manners. And that leads to all kinds of errors that have to be corrected with software and hardware that adds to the complexity and adds to the energy expenditure. It's just become a real barrier that we've had to get really creative to get around. And one of those get arounds is to actually use those quantum properties of electrons to our advantage. This is the idea behind quantum computers. Whenever I cover quantum topics on this channel, it makes me want to talk about something much easier, something more like rocket science or brain surgery. As Niels Bohr once said, if quantum mechanics hasn't profoundly shocked you, then you haven't fully understood it yet. It just runs so counter to our experience of everyday life. Like if I'm holding my phone in my hand, it is 100% in my hand. There's no ambiguity there. But a quantum particle, or a quantum phone in this case, is both in my hand and not in my hand at the same time. It's also simultaneously on my desk right here, on my bedside table, and out in my car. Basically, you could consider every single place in the world that this phone could be and the probabilities that the phone is in any of those places. Until that phone is observed, and then the quantum wave function collapses and it's 100% in my hand. Now, this is obviously a metaphor for quantum particles. Phones don't work this way. If you keep losing your phone, um, that's on you. And as I covered in a previous video, this weird quantum superposition stuff can be used to our advantage in using quantum computers. And that was a fairly popular video, you guys seem to like it, um, but there's actually been a lot of things that have happened since then, so I thought this might be a good time to revisit that topic and see what new has happened with quantum computers. So if you haven't seen that video and you aren't really caught up on the basics of quantum computing, I'm just going to sort of skim over it here, so if you want a more deeper look into it, you can go to this video right here. Seriously, press pause, go watch that video, come back to this one. The algorithm will probably hate me for it, but hey, for science! But yeah, the quick uh, skimmed over TLDR version is that classical computers use these gates like I was talking about before. They open and close, they create ones and zeros and does calculations with it. Those are classical computers and those ones and zeros are known as bits. Quantum circuits use uh, quantum bits, also known as qubits, to perform the same functions, but instead of just having a one and zero, they have a whole variety of values. And by inputting questions about those values, programmers can output logical answers. It's kind of like a game of 20 questions. You might start by saying, you know, is it bigger than a shoebox or is it smaller than a house? Now to complicate things, there are multiple types of quantum gates, some that deal with superposition, some that deal with imaginary numbers, and some that deal with entanglement. Now if I lost you there, it's okay. This is all stuff that's still being worked out by really smart people who know more about this than you and I ever will, but that's what's known as quantum gate. Uh, architecture. There is another type that I talked about in my previous video, it's called quantum annealing. And for 20 years now, the Canadian company D-Wave Systems has been creating quantum annealing computers. Uh, there used to be a debate as to whether or not their effects were actual quantum effects, but I think that's been cleared up by now. Now annealing as a concept, uh, it's, it's nothing new. It basically means heating something up and then cooling it down. Humans have been annealing metal since prehistoric times. Heating a material like metal or, or glass, it basically just makes it easier to work with. Um, and if you do it at the right rate, it can actually make it stronger. What you're basically doing is just heating out the lumps and bumps and making a more smooth consistency. The quantum equivalent of this is using qubits to find the ground state of a system. And the ground state is basically its lowest energy capacity or its capacity to do work. Like if I drop a penny from a second floor window, it'll have less energy than a penny dropped at the 14th floor window. The closer it is to the ground, the lower its energy state. Ground state is where it's 
literally laying on the ground. In D-Wave's quantum computers are, are designed to find this ground state for simulated systems. This makes them really good for optimization tasks. That's, you know, trying to perform a task using the least amount of energy possible. I identify with this process. So D-Wave scientists envision using this sort of quantum annealing technique to do general purpose computing in the future, although many experts think that quantum computers will never quite overtake uh, classical supercomputers in every use case. But going back to the logic gate side of things for just a second, there have been some headlines worth mentioning from this last year. Yes, these computers have gotten more powerful. Yes, they've added more gates, but scaling up quantum circuitry is more than just adding more gates. Error detection and rectification is a major problem for these computers. If they aren't kept at extremely cold temperatures and shielded from the outside world, then outside noise can get in and screw up the output of these qubits. This is known as decoherence. It's kind of a catch-22. The more gates that you add, the more error correction you have to perform, uh, which requires more software, more hardware, and it just kind of builds up and builds up. But back in February, scientists at Yale created a new type of quantum gate. They're now able to entangle more types of quantum qubits. And this opens up the possibility of universal error correction. Since entangled qubits have corresponding values, you can test one to verify the other. Also, a team at the University of New South Wales announced on May 13th that they've achieved a new benchmark of two qubit fidelity. I know, right? It's actually a big deal. Fidelity is basically a measure of accuracy, which they've been able to do at 99.96% for single qubit systems, but they've never been able to do that for multiple qubit systems. But that's what they were able to do at the University of New South Wales. They did a two qubit system at 98% uh, fidelity. Now, ultimately, scientists want to build these devices with thousands of qubits, so this is a huge, big first step. In bigger news, a lot of attention has been paid over the last year to the idea of quantum supremacy, the race for quantum supremacy. Uh, this was something that's been talked about since the 1980s, although the term wasn't really even coined until 2012. Quantum supremacy basically means the point at which quantum computers can outperform classical supercomputers, at least in certain applications anyway. And the big news last year was when Google introduced their 72-qubit bristlecone chip, and they said that they would be able to do that with this chip, and NASA got on board, and they've been helping them to test it out over the last year. So things were looking really good for Google for a while there. But then IBM said, hold my beer, and they performed the same test that NASA was doing on their Summit supercomputer, and were able to do it at what they consider to be 121 uh, gate chip, whereas Bristlecone is only 72. Granted, they use like a thousand times more power than Bristlecone uses, but you know. Meanwhile, researchers at Tsinghua University in Beijing have been able to use quantum computers to do a popular machine learning algorithm. This was done by a Chinese media entity called Synced, and they claimed that this uh, was able to actually achieve quantum supremacy. The rest of the world has yet to weigh in on that. But the most interesting development in the quantum gate side of computing has to be IBM's release of Q-System 1. This is the first um, commercially available for use quantum computer that you can't take it home with you, but you can actually uh, play with it online. IBM has partnered with universities around the world, including some facilities like CERN and Fermilab to do some really cool science stuff. And they actually put together a quantum programming language called Kixquit. It's, just, it's, it's such a bad name. All right, so let's bounce back over to the annealing side of things and talk about the advancements we've seen in D-Wave over the years. The first system was the D-Wave 1 in 2011, which had 128 qubits that could perform exactly one kind of mathematical optimization. Keep in mind 128 qubits is actually quite small in the annealing model. In fact, it didn't really make much noise until they introduced the D-Wave 2 with 512 qubits in 2013. In 2015, the D-Wave 2X got the interest of Los Alamos National Laboratory, and in 2017, they released the 2000Q, which is a 2048 qubit model. This year, in 2019, D-Wave announced their next release, which will feature 5000 qubits and a new staggered arrangement to provide for greater connectivity. And here's the problem with D-Wave. What does that even mean? Quantum annealing, at least the way that D-Wave does it, is just so different from the quantum gate model that we don't even really know what 5,000 qubits means. Is 5,000 qubits in the annealing model better than uh, you know, 72 qubits in the quantum gate model? I have no way of knowing. In the right applications, D-Wave expects to pass by all their quantum uh, competitors, leave them in the dust, um, and, and eventually be able to outperform regular classical supercomputers. Are they actually going to be able to do this? It's too early to say. But if you're curious and you want to try it out, D-Wave did release a website called Leap, where you can actually use one minute per month of their 2000Q model. And I know one minute doesn't sound like much, but this is a very, very fast computer. 
You can run hundreds or even thousands of optimization programs on Leap in just one second, and it's totally free to join. If you want to try it out, I'll put a link down in the description. They really ought to get Scott Bakula to be their pitch man for that, I feel like, you know, because Quantum Leap, Quantum Leap, it was a show. Now, one thing that D-Wave has looked into is business applications like order fulfillment. Recently, an online grocery company called Okado looked into using D-Wave to optimize their warehouse operation, which uses this crazy grid of 250,000 bins and 1,100 robots that pick products and drop them off autonomously so that online orders can be filled in less than five minutes, which is kind of insane. That kind of insane requires about 3 million calculations per second. Unfortunately, D-Wave's computers aren't quite up to that task yet, there's a good chance our next iteration will be. And this illustrates what quantum computing really needs right now, a killer app. Quantum annealing and quantum gate computers are still trying to catch up to classical supercomputers in terms of what they can do, but there are certain applications where they might have an advantage. I've been sort of casually following this space ever since I did that last video, and I've gotta say, I think we're getting really close to a tipping point here. Whether it's Okado or some other company that uses D-Wave as their optimization engine, um, that will be the moment that quantum computing gets out of the lab and enters our daily lives. From there, we might see them in the chemistry field as they simulate uh, reactions and chemistry labs. We might start to see them in the medical field because they can simulate protein folding really well, transportation, AI, the list goes on and on. There'll probably never be a time when we see quantum computing completely replace classical computing, but what we might see in the coming future, and what I hope to see, is a combination of the two, something that uses the strength of both systems together. In the end, the pursuit of quantum supremacy is a great motivating factor, but ultimately, what might be even better than quantum supremacy is cooperation. So let's take a few seconds to appreciate just how awesome cooperation is. Thank you, well done. If at any time during this video your eyes started to glaze over because quantum mechanics is just kind of a bit too much for your brain computer, uh, one series you might want to check out is called Exploring Quantum History with Brian Greene on CuriosityStream. This is a short three-part series that walks you all the way from the beginning of our understanding of quantum mechanics to quantum computers and beyond, presented by one of the best minds in that field, Brian Greene. If nothing else, it'll give you a base of knowledge that you can tap into on this topic when it comes up in the future. And I think you'll be hearing a lot more about this in the future, so that's a good thing. And if you're a viewer of this channel, you can watch that for free because CuriosityStream is offering viewers of this channel the first 30 days for free if you sign up at curiositystream.com slash Joe Scott. CuriosityStream was created by some of the minds behind the Discovery Channel, and it's chock full of thousands of documentaries and subjects ranging from science, history, art, technology, whatever piques your curiosity. Yeah, I don't know about you, but I cut the cord a long time ago, and right now my life is just all about streaming services. There's streaming services for movies, streaming services for TV, and CuriosityStream is a streaming service for awesome uh, nature and science documentaries. And the crazy thing is it's actually one of the least expensive out there. It's only $2.99 a month. But you don't even have to pay that for the first 30 days if you sign up at curiositystream.com slash Joe Scott. You get the first 30 days for free. It's an awesome service. You got nothing to lose. Check it out. Link's down in the description. Big thanks to CuriosityStream for supporting this video and a huge shout out to my answer files on Patreon that are building a community, helping me out, getting to know each other. It's a good time, y'all. There's some new people that have some names I need to murder real quick. We got Rob Murray, Mike Sage, Don Fairchild, Scott Burleson, Ryan, Andreas Herlin, uh, Mark Berenger, John Carter, Keaton Brandt, Brian Wakeley, Sam Samuel L. Wilson, Lori A. McKay, uh, Michael, Michael Ottinger, Donald, Harry Evett, Mark Roy and Timothy Gack. Thank you guys so much. If you would like to join them and uh, just be a cool guy like they are and have access to me and other people and do some cool things, early access to videos, I could go on. You can go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. Please like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, I invite you to check out this one because Google thinks you'll like that video too. Any other video with my face on it, you can check those out. And if you do like them, if you do like the kind of stuff that I talk about, I invite you to subscribe. I come back with videos every Monday and every Thursday. T-shirts available at the store, answerswithjoe.com slash shirts. Don't miss out on that. Thank you again for watching. You guys go out now, have an eye-opening week, and I'll see you on Monday. Love you guys. Take care.